Glad to be here. Let me tell you how I got here. Um, started my career in public accounting, and if you don't know what that is, was with one of the big firms. And it's kind of meaningful, uh, maybe not to you, but that's where all the, quote, smart people were that were working with big companies and so on and so forth. So I uh, was in public accounting about eight or nine years, and then CFO of a couple different companies, and then we sold one. And so I was basically unemployed. I got a call from a friend, a CPA friend in Spartanburg, and says, I have a medical practice that needs some help. And I said, okay, I'm unemployed. I'll, I'll go meet with them. So we set up the meeting, the lunch meeting. You know, I have a plan for this meeting. I have my tie on, like, you know, I'm all dressed up. I go to this office, it's kind of dark and cluttery. I go to this back room and there's probably six or seven places for people to sit. There's things hung on the wall and there's a chicken sandwich sitting on the desk. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, I typically have business lunches. This is not a business lunch. But it's a grilled chicken sandwich, so maybe, you know, it's just special. So I eat my sandwich, and we talk, and we pray. I had never experienced that before in my business career. I've been in business for, at that point, 12, 15 years. We prayed. We talked and we talked. We finished up the meeting, and I'm leaving, and I had, give me a hug. And maybe hugging is more common now, but in 2009, it wasn't. I went home. I said, Chris, I had a very strange meeting today. <laughs> and she says, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm unemployed. I may as well go, you know, take the next step. And I did. And it has been a blessing ever since. Fifteen years ago, we've, not all because of me, we've been from, I think, two offices, six providers, soon to be five offices, 17 providers. So it's been an incredible journey, and hopefully... I've certainly learned a lot through the group in, in my time, and so both dealing with people and being generous and understanding there's more to business than business. I'm going to cover a lot of business today, but at the end we'll circle back and talk a, bit, a little bit about being generous. So during this time of 15 years, I had the opportunity not only to work with Southern Eye, but had other referrals, like Curd and others would meet practices in the upstate or, or, or other CPA friends would say, hey, James, I hear you're doing some medical work, help this practice. So I had the opportunity to probably visit 10 other or so practices just to help them out. They were, quote, financially struggling. So I saw a lot of disasters. Um, and then we saw some not-so-disasters where you really had to get in the details and take care of the pennies, so to speak. Uh, it wasn't a really quick fix for those practices. Um, so I did that, too. And again, working with these guys, they were generous enough to let me do that and help other, these other practices. So we'll talk a bit about that. In the end, we'll end up you know, talking about giving some money away. Uh, we'll finish that up in the end. These are the three most common that I would always see in terms of disasters. Now, probably since you're here, your practice maybe is not one of those disaster situations, but there could be some of these items that you need to at least take another look at and just make sure you've got the, um, the big items covered. The first one, where there are always issues is billing and collections. 
um, I was called up to a practice in the upper part of the state, and one of the second things I look at is building collections. So I was going through and looking at denied claims, and I saw a lot of them, like on one doctor and one OD, a lot on vision plans, and they were just sitting there. What's the problem? These guys, they weren't credentialed on those, those insurances. Somehow the ball was dropped. They were credentialed on maybe the top three, but they were four or five others that they weren't credentialed on. It was a new doctor. The OD weren't credentialed on vision plans. So it was a basic error that it was just overlooked. Unbilled visits. Anyone had this problem in their practice? You may not know it, whether it be a visual field that gets overlooked. I had a practice that not only they had a lot of testing that wasn't billed, they just didn't have a process in place. There was no process to, if the appointment was closed out, that it was ensured that it was billed. And it seemed like an easy thing but when we converted from an old EMR system to a newer one, we caught a lot of things that weren't being built in our practice. So it, it can happen. One of the easier items that can creep up on you, and you may not be a disaster practice, so to speak, is the denied claims that just sit there and are not worked. Because you kind of don't see them. Or they could just be written off. Do, do you know what I mean by that? A lot of blank faces. Probably not since we don't have any building collection folks in here. But what happens is the claim is submitted. The insurance company says, no, we're not paying it for whatever the reason. The building and collection folks, it either sits there and ages, or they, they just write it off, and then it's never seen. So this is one of those that are in the details, but if you ever have concerns, you need to look at it. And don't just, don't just ask the question and move on. But if you have some concerns in your practice that your buildings are declining, they don't look typical to another practice, they look low, don't just ask the questions. Say, hey, could you print me out a list of unpaid claims by payer, by patient, by CPT? If they, if they say it's too hard or I can't do that, that's the first sign. So if you even get that list, you could circle a few items on there and just, hey, well, show me this claim. How old is it? It's not a whole lot of work, but it's going to give you some comfort level when you see the list. Do I have a lot of old things? I mean, I, have a, I had a practice I went to see, and uh, I had that list, you know, printed. and I knew their EMR, so I went and printed it myself, and I should and there was over $400,000 sitting at old, older than 60 days. And the number can get really large, especially if you have surgeries, you know, because you know, a surgery could be a reimbursement, 1000 to $2,000. So if those surgeries are denied for whether or not a, a pre-auth or not coded correctly, they'll sit there. So it uh, could be a big item. Lack of or bad contracts. I see this all the time. Or they're not signed. Make sure you have those key, ingredient, key ingredients signed. Buying and buyouts. Your owner compensation formula. I had a practice in the upstate and they said, well, we have this partner who wants to retire, and he wants to be paid his AR. 
I said, well, where's your buying and buyout agreement? Where's your operating agreement? Well, we don't have one. We just kind of said he's be paid X dollars in, and then we deal with it when he, you know, when he's time to retire. Well, he thought he should be paid for his AR, and when we looked at the records from the accountant, he had been over-distributed $600,000 because he had slowed down working the last two years. So the other owners were ahead. He was behind in terms of covering his overhead. And so since they did not have a written agreement, it becomes a dispute and becomes trouble. So if you don't have written agreements, it may be fine now, but when you get to a point of an exit or an issue, it becomes more of an issue more of a problem let me say one other thing on, on agreements you don't necessarily have to use a high powered $400 an hour lawyer from a compensation standpoint it, get, at least get something in writing if you're a small practice two partners get it write it down sign it Employment agreements for your mid-levels or your ODs. You don't have to necessarily use that high-power law for every agreement. You can update what you have, but just get it in place. If you don't have a resource in your practice to help you with these contracts, go to a, you know, a one or two practice uh, law office, some folks you know, so get the agreements done. The biggest area that makes the biggest impact that I've seen in practices in terms of financials and making improvement is when I see underutilized or overpaid providers. So the first thing I would look at when I went to a practice, I want to see the list. I'd do me a list. Here's what they're paid, including some, over, including some direct expenses, and here's what they collect. So I look at that percentage. What is that percentage? Typically, I would see somewhere between 25 and maybe 40 percent their pay as a percent of their collections. Does those numbers ring true to any of you guys? Because what I'm looking at is then seeing what the practice overhead is and see if there's a difference. See if there's a cushion. If the practice overhead is 60 percent, hopefully you're, you're only paying your providers somewhere around 35 percent. So you got some margin to buy equipment. To invest in the business, so on and so forth. Does that make sense? But by and large, this is where I've seen home runs. Probably, not, maybe not in your practice, but the ones that are really quote disasters. This is where the problem is. Let me show you one. I don't have that. That's is this the updated slides. Let's see if we can find that slide. I'm going to move on. We'll come back to it. But I want to show you a practice I, look at, I looked at, and you'll see where I did this analysis and how they were overpaying all their providers. I want to show you that. We'll come back to it. Okay. Well, Anyway, so that slide was going to show you a group of physicians in a practice where they were paying most of them 70 to 100 percent of their collections. I mean, it was a disaster. It sounds odd, but it does happen. So you probably wonder, what do I see and how these practices have these big issues or disasters? It's not like I go in and see 
fo folks that are not working hard or not devoted or completely inexperienced is quite the opposite. They, they've been there for a while, and that's just the way they've always done it. So I encourage you to make sure you have the right people in place for your size practice. If they have some financial knowledge, and if they don't, you know, get that financial knowledge. And if you as a doctor are too busy to tend to the business, get somebody to do it. Because, again, a common theme in these practices is the doctors are too busy. And they're relying on this person that they've had there for years, and they feel comfortable with them because they feel like they trust them. And that person's doing a fine job. They're working hard. But they're not knowledgeable enough in terms of to move forward with technology and they just don't quite know business. It's really not their fault. They need more support or just in the wrong role. And we experienced that some at Southern Eye. And I experienced that in some of the other practices. Another one is relying on third parties. At least two examples I saw where the practice was paying an external accountant somewhere between fifty and $75,000 a year just to keep the books. And what that means is they're giving them, here's your monthly financial. They just give it to them. And so the doctors kind of thought that the accountant was taking care of them, giving them business advice. They weren't. The example of the, the, the practice I said where they were overpaying the, one of the owners, over-distributing 600000 well, was on the report that they gave the doctors, but never really explained to them to say, hey, you're keep, He's not, bring, he's not covering his overhead. So don't trust, I don't say don't trust, don't rely on third parties completely. I had a practice, their billing collections were outsourced, they thought everything was taken care of, and it was a big problem. They didn't really, they just said, oh, they handled it and not really concerned that it, whether it was done right. They never really looked at it. So be careful in relying on third parties. Utilizing software and technology, that's ever, ever changing, but uh, lots of examples of folks not using EMR and PMR, PM to their fully function, functionality. In terms of technology and software, let me tell you a little story. Southern Eye, we've been able to use technology and software to keep our staff low as we grow. From six providers, two offices, we had two folks doing accounting, HR, payables. Soon to be five offices, 17 providers. And we're going to have two, about two also. Because we're able to integrate HR and payroll systems, we've been able to use a bill processing and payable system that's integrated to our accounting system. We've decentralized some of the hiring process instead of the, all the employees coming in sitting with one person. So think about this. We went from 48 employees to 100, and we got two, two, still two staff ha handling all the accounts payable, HR, and accounting because of technology and software. Oh, there we go. That was a slide I was going to tell you before. I mean, look at this. Look at it in red. Provider pay as a percent of collections. Those are MDs. Plastics guys. Just cat look at the cataract guys. Look at the ODs. At least we got one that was somewhat okay. But again, this is primarily due to the contracts aren't stru structured properly. I'm a firm believer with any provider, it needs to be productivity-based. Straight salary just doesn't incentivize anyone to be efficient, to work hard, so on and so forth. So needs to say none of those contracts with those providers were productivity-based. And I think that's how they ended in that direction. Here was the numbers I just chatted a minute, minute ago about in terms of tech and software. Six providers, two offices, 43 employees. 14 providers, three offices, 95 employees. 
And that's what I mentioned about how we've used technology. Sometimes there's not big disasters, but you have to look towards the pennies. MIPS can be a big number. I've been to some practices and they said, well, two of them exactly. We didn't do MIPS because it, it's, it's not worth it. Well, it's worth it. Everybody knows MIPS is worth it, either getting a bonus or getting penalized because it's big numbers now. We're, ophthalmology is 55% Medicare, so it's a big number. Let me tell you a story about pennies and, and, and efficiencies. About uh, two or three years ago, well, I had a client that was a practice I worked with, and they only worked half days on Friday. So I mentioned this to Brad, and it got in his head. This is about two or three years ago. He goes, gosh, I, wanna, I only want to work a half day on Friday. Let's close all offices. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm not sure if we should do this. And, he's, and he really pressed it. So the practice changed from five days a week to four and a half days a week. What happened was all those patients, we saw the same number of patients four and a half days a week. Our staffing costs were lower and everyone still got out on time because we were not forced, but everybody sat and said, okay, how am I going to do this better? How do I don't waste time over here? How do I pick up some seconds and some minutes over here? But I don't, I, it, how many folks in this office is, are, are your o office open five days a week? Everybody's five days? I'll tell you, the four and a half day, it's the staff are ecstatic. They love it. And I'll still promise you, you know, who's, who went, who's in here in our practice that was with five days? I guess Brad and Kurt. You've seen the same number of patients. Wait, yeah. Staff happy, everybody's ready to go home because Friday afternoon kind of, kind of is inefficient after 1 o'clock anyway, if you think about it. But our staff costs went down and patient volume stayed the same. Make sure I'm right on time. I got a minute, a minute about a minute, two minutes left. Is that right? Q&A, okay. Um, so we talked about making money. So one of the things that, you know, after the hugging and praying and all that blessing, is then I would, those first couple years, we'd have these meetings and I'd, you know, I had this big list. Here's what we're doing. Here's what we need to change. Or we'd have a decision about an employee that really would not quite working out. You know, we're going to have to part ways. Oh, let's, and they'd, they'd want to spend more money. I was like, we don't have to. Here's the good business decision. But I learned it's not always about the dollars. And there's generosity and blessing that, that I've learned that has touched me that you can have in your practice. And it's not necessarily you're giving away the farm. Some of it's small things. I remember when I started looking through credit card receipts and I saw these gift cards and these meals. W what is all this? Well, it was gift cards to the employees. It was meals to employees or patients. You know, sometimes, we, where's the practice manager? Oh, she's out delivering a meal, you know, to a patient or an employee. You think about gift cards and things of that nature, you know, a $50 gift card to somebody making $30,000 a year or thirty-five. dollars that's a lot of money. That's groceries. So it's not a lot of money to you, but it's a lot of money to them. Of course, there's other ways than besides money, and obviously one of the reasons, well, one of the reasons our practice, Southern Iowa, wants to maintain their independence uh, is how they treat the patient, patients, the prayer, to be able to spend time with them. Uh, and that prayer and being gener generous is not always just due to their eye condition. Uh, it's their conversations they have with patients about their family, what's going on in their life.
So one thing I'll, I'll leave you with being generous. I've learned so much in that, but in 2010 when I started with these guys, they said, hey, we'd like to start a nonprofit. Uh, and so I kicked that off. We hired a young lady that Kurt knew. She was driving around in her car with an eye chart. It started off as Surgeons for Sight. We renamed it to Servants for Sight. And now we have a 40-foot-long bus. We're probably doing 100 cataract surgeons, surgeries a year, probably seeing over 500 patients in the upstate, either in the van or in clinic. So it's been a huge success. And these guys supported it pretty much on their dime for the first two or three years, and now it's self-supporting. So. Okay, I think that's about all I have. Certainly I know it wasn't as technical or as interesting in what Mr. Ed had to show us, but um, questions and answers. Thanks, James. Um, a few things. One, if you're not watching your business, it's going to get away from you. And none of us really like insurance. Raise your hand if you actually like dealing with insurance. Nobody's hands going up. My wife's a dentist. She talked to her billing specialist. And they, some insurance companies have a policy just to blanket deny claims. They don't even look at them. And so if you're just writing all of those off and not even looking at the claim and not even figuring out what's going on with it, then they're winning. <laughs> it's not a us versus them, but it's a game that they're playing. And unfortunately, we're the middlemen or women. <laughs> um, and so we have to figure out a way to represent ourselves and our patients because our patients are paying these premiums to insurances and they're not getting the services they're deserving and we're losing out as physicians because we're trying to do what's best for them. And so you have to be your own advocate. One, one thing we did a few years back, and it's been hugely beneficial, is we, um, we hired an optometrist to come into the office. We went to the four and a half day a week, but we liked having covers that Friday afternoon. So we, we, hired, we, we had a, held a local event, met the local optometrist at an educational event we held, picked the best personality in the room who was working at a commercial mm -hmm. um, where he was working on Saturdays all the time. He was mm -hmm. thrilled to come to work for us and just work Monday through Friday. Right. And he works our Friday afternoons. All the rest of us are off, so our staff love it to stay on to help him. We put him on a salary, not on a production base, so he's happy to see whether they're paying patients or non-paying. He doesn't uh -huh. care at all. Right. We just set the quota of how many people we'd like for him to see, and if he d meets that, then we have preset bonuses for the summer and Christmas. He is thrilled, and by him doing that, he see, we see our one-day post-ops, but he sees all our one-month post-ops, refractions, which has freed us up to see paying patients Right, and um, he his the p the people that he sees that are paying covers his salary completely, so he's completely self sufficient. So right. he's freed us up from Friday afternoons, and we can we're not seeing those one months. We're seeing people we can bill for. So sure. we've each individually become more profitable, and and the camaraderie is great. Yeah. So that was one of the best moves we've made in the last five years. When and did you? Uh, changed from uh, five to four and a half days probably about five years ago okay yeah. and the staff love it exactly. and our staff retention is fabulous because um, no staff member has to work more than one Friday afternoon a month mm -hmm. so three three out of the four everybody's out they get out three out of the four Fridays a month they get out at, at one o'clock yeah. and so we don't really have a lot of people leaving us to go to other practices in town because they have to work Fridays yeah. and take call and stuff yeah thanks for that it was uh, again repeating myself it was certainly a success story uh, I can see if you do, if you're not four and a half days I'd at least look at it if you're having struggle with staff so on and so forth
That was a fantastic talk. My question is, if, um, if you were to give advice to a small private practice on how to do something like this, essentially, you know, it's run by doctors, but we don't know what we don't know. You know, wh what advice would you give to find someone like you to be doing what you're doing? I guess what I'm trying to say is, can I get your phone number? <laughs> <laughs> Hi there, I'm Grace Patella. Um, I've got a solo peds practice, and I'm lucky enough to have a pretty good CPA to help us out. Um, I'm curious, both for you and for everyone in the room, um, our kids go to a dentist who, of course, has a membership option. They don't even worry with insurance. And um, there are some optometrists who have started to explore this, but I'm curious if anyone here knows of or has experience developing a membership plan for annual exams, uh, imaging, and testing? Anyone? Th this topic has been brought up a couple times by Kurt in our practice. To be honest, for me, it, I've never really taken it serious because Medicare's in ophthalmology is what, 60%, and the in office reimbursement rates for eye exams is really high. You get killed on vision plans. So I'm not saying it's not something to explore. I'm just being honest with you, at least from our perspective. I guess reimbursement from Medicare for surgery is, is lower than, but in office, I love Medicare reimbursement for office exams. One, one last question. So um, James is a friend. He's, you know, he's uh, so integral to our practice, but James, the one question that wasn't quite answered. So what it, so you came in and you found so many problems. We just hired you as a consultant at first, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. as a full-time person. But if we had a smaller practice out there that was a little unsure, how would you, what would you be looking for in someone to say, can you come in and maybe do an audit or just take a look at our books and mm -hmm. help us with some of this big stuff? Yeah. Once you have the the primary issues identified, then it's going to be finding the right person then to manage. Uh, and that can be hard, especially for a small practice, because the person often has to have such a varied, wide experience, a little bit of finance, a little bit of billing collections. So it's really got to be somebody that has a wide experience. Uh, in terms of you're looking for somebody to do a practice checkup, um, there, I'm, I'm not sure where you're located, but there are groups that are medical practice focused that can do pra quote practice checkups. Uh, so certainly give, let's, we can chat afterwards and exchange um, contacts. Okay, thanks so much.